Right. Thanks for coming to our having model book symposium. I don't know if we will ever have a second one. Yeah, maybe in two years, someone, if someone published something, please let us know. Yeah, so uh, Tony is going to give a, kind of an opening uh, remark of uh, Hakan's book. And then after that, I will invite Hakan over to the stage and then question him. No, we will we'll give him some questions. And then, and then uh, we'll spend about like, we'll, we'll save about like 20, 30 minutes for like, you know, discussions and questions. Anything you want to ask Hakan? Yeah, he's not prepared. We didn't tell him anything. Yeah, that's the best many critical questions. I wrote the book. Yeah, right. So I'll pass it to Tony. Thank you. Okay, sure. Uh, so thank you very much for having me here. My name is actually not on the program. So you're trick here, and now it's too late to, uh, to leave. So please remain seated uh, for a while. Um, in my session, so in my introduction to Ophelia, I said we have known each other since 2010. Um, Hagwan and I have known each other since 2011, so the relationship is slightly um, younger than some others. Um, once uh, Dave Chalmers said, never begin a talk with apologies, but after that, I began to apologize in my talk. So the first one is that when I feel really nervous or I'm going to be nervous, I write down what I'm going to talk about and I will read through them. I know some people, many people in the audience wouldn't like that kind of style, but I guarantee you that in my case, I write down things when I re read them through, it will work slightly better. Okay, so but first of all, as Hagwan said yesterday, the book is open access, it's legal. So do read it after this session. Um, so many of the materials below are from our book review. So I wrote it with a recent PhD from uh, Brown's lab. So I do apologize again, if you, you have read the book review, which is quite unlikely. So the book review is here, um, you can download it later. So there was a time when Psychologists focus mostly on experiment and piecemeal progresses, leaving big pictures and theoretical adventures to philosophers. That time has ended as we see substantive theoretical frameworks coming out of exper experimentalist minds. So along with being you by Anil Thais and no self by Steve Fleming, in consciousness we trust is yet another contribution in the same vein. The book epitomizes Hakuan Lao's research program in cognitive psychology and neuroscience in the past two decades, which deals with thorny theoretical issues concerning the nature of conscious experiences. It touches on the empirical literature on conscious perception, attention, metacognition, rational control, emotion, and the sense of agency, among others. But the book does not simply review findings. It also presents an empirically informed original theory of consciousness. Lao's narrative is alive and in includes many personal journeys which make the book very readable and intriguing. The book has an introduction and nine chapters and usefully contains succinct yet inform um, informative summaries of chapters. So in what follows, I will summarize the book in my own way and then I will just ask two quick questions. So chapter one discusses the relations between subjective experience, wakefulness, and voluntary control. He also introduces the key contrast between global and local theories and five key theses that help arbitrate between the global and the, the local. Chapter two argues that the relevant evidence favors the view that the prefrontal cortex is part of the neural correlate of consciousness. He also discusses the nature of NCC, blind sight, stimulus, confounder, binocular rivalry, and no cognition paradigms. Chapter three points out that the relevant lesions and stimulation studies, barring certain conceptual confusions, further support the prefrontal involvement of consciousness. Chapter four discusses the relation between attention and the apparent richness of consciousness 
and how it creates problems for local theories. He also discusses a traditional puzzle speckle hand in philosophy, the classical partial report paradigm in psychology by Sperling, low theory of attention, peripheral vision, and so on. Chapter five di discusses potential functions of consciousness and covers issues such as subliminal, subliminal priming, Libet's cl classical experiment on volition and free will, and metacognition. The result here puts pressure on global theories. Chapter six argues that neither global nor local theories seem right, given what has been discussed so far. So the author's alternative, the centralist proposal looms large. He also discusses issues such as predictive coding, constraints of a plausible theory of consciousness, and how recent progresses in artificial intelligence can shed light in this regard. Chapter seven discusses the perceptual reality theory which predicts that some non-human animals are unconscious, while some artificial systems could be conscious. He also discusses optimal Bayesians, phantom limbs, higher order thoughts versus beliefs, inner sense, and many other issues. Chapter A relates consciousness as understood in the current context and consciousness in the context of the social and clinical sciences, that is, rational grasp of reality. He does this by discussing split brain cases, schizophrenia, affective experiences, among other things. Chapter nine dives into the heart of consciousness studies, the heart problem, and argues that cognitive neuroscientific theories do better than so-called metaphysical theories. He also touches on important notions such as quality space and analog representations. So I have two related questions. I will read them through first and explain why they are related. Um, oh, I'm almost done. The first one is, what roles do the structures of temporal lobes, for example, PPA, FFA, and LOC play in generating consciousness? Do they provide contents only, for example, faces, regardless of whether the contents are conscious? So may maybe you have covered this in yesterday's talk somehow, but I think it would be nice to to discuss it directly. My own tentative answer to this is yes, and I'll um, very briefly explain about it. The second one is, nowadays it is common to claim that the NCC research program is obsolete. What, what do you think? Do you think it's really the case? Do those new frameworks really go beyond the original NCC research program? My own answer is no, but I'm, I'll be curious about your answer. So the reason why, or at least one reason why these two questions are related is that if for the first question, the answer is positive, then originally um, in the past, people think that there are some uh, places or network or activities responsible for consciousness, but other networks or activities are responsible for content. And I think that's totally fine, but I think some new framework seems to misinterpret the old project, saying that those different areas are um, doing nothing about consciousness. Maybe what I just said wasn't very clear, but I want to save more, more time to Hakwan and to, to Sean. So together with a PhD student in psychology who shall remain nameless for now, this book is slowly being translated into Mandarin. But the question is how should we do with the title? It's very difficult to translate it. So tentatively we call this, if you know Mandarin, you know, which is of course not quite right because it means in the name of, of consciousness. But I think we think it's, it's good to some extent because it's also, religious or you know in certain certain kind of flavor but if you have any suggestion please let us know uh many thanks for your consciousness but i'm not done yet um there's one more thing so i mentioned that we met in 2011 that's not exactly the night we met um i think we met sometime in february but hakwan is here um that's the hakwan law i remember and i know um, even after 12 years. So that's that's all for me. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, first of all, thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for organizing this for me. 
very flattering and such an honor. Um, I had to say this even though it's already said, like, I, I hope it's not too self-promotional, the book is free. And, and I, my good friend, uh, Richard Brown, who's, uh, who was sitting, standing next to me when, when we were playing football in the picture, he is a philosopher and he used to be also the drummer of my band. But he, when he saw the book, he actually said, uh, it's so silly, why wouldn't you put your theory in your first chapter and then present the evidence as supporting your theory? Um, I disagree. Um, I thought, I, of course I thought about that, but I, I think the, the very important point of the book is exactly that it's not so much about my, my own theory. In fact, I think the theory is almost like an afterthought, like a footnote. The more important part is really the, 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 the data. So the book really, I hope that regardless of whether you agree with me, the first few chapters really usefully summarize uh, not just my own studies, but the, the whole literature on MCC. Um, so MCC, yeah, so basically I agree with Tony. Um, you, the, the early sensory activities, what by early I mean that anything in, including in temporal areas, so anything in the higher visual areas also I would consider them the same, that they mostly provide a content. Now, it does not mean that the early century area activities cannot, does not have any correlates that would reflect the, the, the uh, quality or the, the epistemic status of the, of the content. Uh, obviously, it comes from somewhere. So if you're imagining something, I don't, I don't mean to say that your, your uh, ventral temporal activity would be exactly the same as seeing something. And seeing it more clearly obviously also needs to more into Overall, the coding is, uh, is to really track the content. It tracks the, um, what is called first order content, basically. So you can name those neurons, like this is a, this is a cat neuron, this is a, this is a house neuron, this is a face neuron. It really refers to uh, you know, a, a categorical label that, that applies to objects in the world. And then the, uh, the epistemic status is actually really determined by the higher areas, so with the, the association contacts like the frontal and parietal areas. So that's an interesting question. Why is the second point was a lot of people are saying that the NCC program should be, you know, we should move on. Uh, I find it really very, very, um, I really strongly disagree with that. I mean, if you read the book, you will see that basically the, the, the central theme of the book is that you know, these days there's so many of these grand theories everywhere. Um, a lot of them are very mathematical. Uh, I must say I'm not so fond of them. I also do a little bit of this kind of slightly technical, not nearly as technical as, you know, free energy, second law of thermodynamics, not, none of that. Very simple good old signal detection theory. And I just immediately find that so many errors are in the literature. You go to a vision conference and still there are vision scientists who actually don't fully grasp these things very well. I think as scientists, we should just be more humble that sometimes we are not doing the very basic things very well. And likewise, the, the NCC experiments are also full of controversies, very, very basic issues like confounds. Um, we, we have not dealt with them. I'm not moving on yet. I mean, we are not done yet. Actually, we are very far from that. Uh, if, I, if you allow me to say something more unkind, I would say 90% of the studies on NCC are wrong right now. Uh, so we are very far from done. So I feel we should focus on that. And then once you get the data more or less right, maybe we should speculate a bit of theories in humility, you know, just to stimulate more thoughts, but not to profess all oh, my theory is the best and whatever. I, I find that attitude very very unhelpful and also very jarring. Like if you think about the rest of neurobiology, no one else behaves like that. Like seriously, with so little data, so many flaws in experiments, no one would propose these grand theories like you are, as if you are in theoretical physics. And sometimes, especially in the book, we also talk about uh, physicists uh, in the first chapter. And I think people are sometimes, maybe since it has something to do with you know Oppenheimer and the second world war and all that people get a kind of grandeur grandiose understanding of what physics has done and and they, they think that you know in physics you just sit in an armchair and write some equations and you change the world it's not as simple as that right if you go back to the history 
the, the very foundation of Newtonian physics was, was very hard fought with very rigorous experiments. A lot of Newton's opponents actually grudgingly accepted his laws because they just, they just turned out to be true over and over again. And we are nowhere close to that. So I would say we should stay with the NCC for a while and get, get, you know, get some consensus before we can do that. Good. We can talk more about that. I want to leave more time to Sean and to the floor. No, that was, no, it was, was, it was, it was, it was my, no, no, that was great because you cover like you know five of my questions already. Oh, right. No, no, no. So, so I, I do have a follow up question to that, but then before that, I wanted to ask kind of the opening kind of question, which is, uh, why did you write a book? What was the motivation behind it? Or what was your kind of target audience? Ah, that's a great question too. So, uh, I, I think one of the maybe in hindsight, bit of a mistake of, 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 of the book is that I I really fully intend to just write a boring monograph. Uh, in fact, even so, my my editor. So I've been approached by agencies, and and since I've been writing my blog, so I, I told people I want to write a book. So I've, there are publishers who contacted me and want me to write a popular book, or sometimes a trade book. So you write it for a general audience. Uh, it turns out, usually when you write non-fiction books, you don't make money. But consciousness is actually one area which is an exception. So if you want to write a popular book, you could quite easily make money. Uh, I just didn't want to do that for some reason. Um, but all the same, I, I somehow, after writing the book, I, I decided to give it kind of like a sassy uh, title and, and also have a kind of kind of cute cover. Uh, I think that somehow, I think kind of misled people into thinking the book is popular. It's actually not, it's really boring. It's really written for people like us, like nerds. Uh, it's written for graduate students, students, or about really. Uh, I I feel sorry for the people who just buy it on Amazon and hope that it will be like one of those any set books. No, this is actually a completely different piece. Uh, I think you know, and he was good at what he does, but this book is is not like the same kind of thing. It's, uh, I'm not going to give a TED talk or or do any of that stuff. Uh, I'm really just a boring work a day scientist. So, so that was written mostly for that. And why I wrote it, um, I think there are two reasons. The, the first one is the maybe more honest one is that I, I always wanted to write a book because I once wanted to become a philosopher. So when I was in grad school, I always think that I would just finish my PhD and left and go back to philosophy. And then every three years or so, I would say, I'm going to leave science and go back to philosophy. Even actually up to the point I was at tenure faculty, I still thought I, would, I might do that. Because I started out wanting to really just do philosophy. So in, in, of course, in philosophy, you only get your kind of status with, um, when, you, when you release your, your own magnum opus, the book. So I just wanted to do that. I think that's part of my juvenile, unfinished business. Uh, but the, the less honest, but the more, more be the better sounding reason is I feel that the the literature really, or the field really has too much publicity already. There are so many popular books and some people are very good at doing this kind of stuff. Uh, and they don't really need another popular book at all. However, I think the, for, for the graduate students and, and newcomers to the field, it's really, there's, there's not a lot of good uh, literature review on the empirical literature out there. There are some really bad ones uh, in really high profile journal. Uh, so, so something needs to balance it out, really. Um, so I, I, yeah, I hope. So we, it was in part for for the surface of the field. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I was reading a book, and then, I mean, before I read a book, I wanted to recommend this to my you know, layman friends. Mm -hmm. And when I saw the word like controlling for test performance, I'm like, okay, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it was a really good read for you know, graduate students or postdocs. Yeah, that's my 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 hope. Yeah. Um, so just to follow up on the first NCC question, I wanted to ask how, how do you think we can kind of move the field forward? It's, I mean, it's also kind of relevant to what you talked about, uh, you know, the, the vision science community, right? Because in the global vision science uh, community, it seems that there's a, there's more kind of rules that we can follow, right? You want to study like DUI, you use like a four pages, and that's, there's a set of rules, how you kind of tweak the stimuli and all that, right? So in the book, one of the narrative you have is, you know, we don't have these basics yet in, in our field, in, in consciousness, in our research community. How do you think we can help do that? 
Yeah, I think the um, like a general and a specific point to say the the specific point first is that I think controlling for these confounds are really very very fundamental, right? So it just I mean we we're experimental psychologists or neuroscientists. It's, controlling for, for confounds should not be a be a new thing. It should not be a conceptually complicated thing. In our field, it's just that we somehow, I mean, the, in our field, the, the confines are sometimes more conceptual. So just to give an example, the one thing I talk about a lot is the uh, something I think I, I kind of briefly mentioned near the end of my yesterday's talk. I said like a lot of studies, in fact, I, I would say 95% of what the study or about on conscious perception are really comparing just big signal versus small signal. Right, so conscious is that you see it, and unconscious usually you mask it, so your P prime is zero. So essentially, comparing a huge perceptual signal, a lot of perception, versus a tiny bit of residual perceptual processes. So of course, you know, you would expect these results to support all those theories that says that consciousness is global, memorable, predictive, complex, stable, ignited. You know, it just you're just looking at how the brain is supposed to work, right? You're comparing a good signal versus a small one. So this one, you should control for that. But immediately, it kind of makes it kind of funny. You say, well, can you really control for that, right? There's certain things, if, if conscious perception is strong perception, that you're not supposed to control for that. So in my book, I, I make the example, like, you want to control for people's height, right? So you want to see whether tall people play basketball better than short people. And the answer should be yes. But you, you can now ask, well, can I control for the length of their bones? Well, you can't control for the length of the bones because the length of the bones is what constitutes height. So there are sometimes things that you have to think about whether you're, you're controlling too much or you're asking for the impossible. But I think in, in, in the case of uh, conscious perception, examples like blind sight make, make it quite clear that you can you can actually control for the signal strength. And nobody does that. In the, I mean, literally nobody does that. People who do that are nobody like me. The more important people, the more more influential people, don't want to bother with these kind of controls. So the so the literature is actually quite systematically biased, right? So it's not it's not just a little technical problem. It's, it's a little technical problem with the specific to one experiment. But this is actually a prevalent conceptual flaw in in majority of the studies. So we have to face these problems and and do harder experiments. I think that's the specific. The general, I'll be less long-winded. I think the general point is just that I think we are not very good at discussing these as a, lit as a literature. Um, as a community, we tend to follow trends. And as I said, there are a lot of high-profile papers that are trend-setting, and they are not very good. And despite that, we just follow them anyway. We don't, we don't tend to have these kind of conversations so often and sit down and talk about what, what is the better paradigm. Instead, sometimes these bus phrases would come around, come along now and then. That no, no report paradigm, and suddenly everybody start doing that. Uh, I could say more unkind things about that specifically, but but let me just like stop at that. And I think we just follow trends too too much and don't don't sit down together and talk about this. Thing. I mean, if, if the trend is a good, I mean, what I'm seeing is that if, when we talk about the, the digital science community, yeah, there's a good trends that people can follow, right? As a graduate student, you go to like DSS, you know, and you, up, you start to learn like how people do experiments, how people ask questions, and how people, I don't know, control from compound, right? Yeah, so I guess, you know, to branch out, that question is about, you know, how do we kind of initiate this set of tradition in our community? Yeah, I, yeah, I have no idea. But this may be a good start. I don't know. <laughs> I, yeah, I feel, I feel that this, Saying how to do it is easy, but the, the reality is we we are a small field, and and it's also true that especially especially in the U.S. is very salient. I remember when I was in grad school, um, two other fields are about as young and as small. One is neuroeconomics. We talked about, about almost twenty years ago. Some of you are too young to know, but uh, but back then neuroeconomics is is a small field, and social neuroscience was a small field. In fact, I remember some of our colleagues within consciousness, we think we think very little of those other fields. We think we'll do better. But 20 years passed, and what happened, what happened was those other fields grown to be very strong. And in the US, it's very salient. Every every Ivy League, every you know, top-tier research university hire multiple new new faculty for those fields. And
And then, you know, for every job in the US, when you, when you get a job, you get a startup from the university. So that you recounted is a lot of money that pour into those fields. We didn't get much of that at all. Uh, and then uh, funding, those fields, every, every, every of those faculty get hired by those universities. They got, a, they got a major US grant, and that's on the order of over a million dollars for five years or something. So a lot of money pour into that for that. And we just never did that. So our field is kind of weaker in, in that sense. I think in 2018, uh, Matthias Michel and I ran a survey and asked people within the field, do, they, do, they, do we think that our, our field is actually uh, have, have good standards of rigor? And most people re realize that we don't. So we know that we are not very good actually, but you know, we, we just have to recognize that and try to pay more attention together and try to grow from there. So I mean, I have a follow up on that. So, um, in the book, right, you actually talked about um, basically we need to have more collaboration, right? But, but to do that, we need to have earned the respect from you know, other fields and, and for that. Yeah, so I want to kind of extend on that and ask, you know, how do we branch out? Like, as a, you know, empirical scientist, right, one of the like, wrong experiments to other, you know, for other people, right? We have scientists or whatever, right? But then, like, how? Because how do we convince other people that you know consciousness research is you know really worth consideration? Yeah, I, maybe I don't. I don't really mean to say we need to collaborate with people. I actually don't feel that collaboration is always good. I feel it's almost like trade. Right? When you, you should find a good basis for trade, you have too much of one thing in what is changed for something else. That's when I feel you really should collaborate. But about earning the respect of our neighbors is to me is just a matter of trying. I think. I think a lot of the people in the field have given up on doing that a long time ago, especially because our field has a, I think what is really unique is we have a very, very high uh, level of public interest. So journalists love us, right? So that's also explain why I would say there's some really high profile papers in our field that are actually not very good because the journalists and, and the editors, they saw that what these things seem to sell. So they would often cut us on slack and that's why we, don't do very very rigorous stuff and so if you just you know enjoy the glory and, and ignore what other people think then, then we're fine we'll, we'll, we'll publish those high profile papers but I, I, w I started my first job in New York right, at Columbia when I was uh, uh, very kindly told by my head of department that I was be fired very soon <laughs> on the first day he said like, you know we're gonna fire you right uh, it was quite a quite a useful thing. So in, in the East Coast, I believe they they traditionally do tend to fire a lot of people. And I just so I just took it to heart that I, I always try to go to other people's senior colleagues from other fields and basically ask them to tell tell, tell us what's wrong and try to really impress them. Um, I don't think we try a lot. I, don't, I I think yeah I don't I don't know what what else to say to to say how we can be more successful at doing that. But I think. Maybe we don't even have to talk about it. I don't think we try a lot. I think we should just go to our most hard-nosed colleagues in our in, in our department, in other fields, and just try to tell them, ask them what they think of us. And in fact, I asked it a lot, and what they say often is not very not very nice. Um, so, so having that awareness, I think, already helps a lot. Yeah. I'm going to ask a question uh, for you know, the junior scientists in the room. Uh, so a lot of us, right, when we you know, think about new theories, when we run experiments, right, we kind of follow the trend, as you mentioned, right? In the book, one narrative you have is you, you being a kind of contrarian, right? When you, when you read other theories, you're like, oh, no, I'm going to prove this is wrong, right? Well, I'm going to run experiments, I'm going to, you know, I don't know, do something about it, right? How does that kind of shape your own research program? I think that's, in a way, uh, for better or worse, or maybe unfortunately, it's kind of my persona. Even now, probably I see some people raise eyebrows as I say things here, right? I, partly I come from philosophy, so that one. Second, I, I come from maybe parents or families that argue a lot, and, and I'm kind of used to that. Uh, but I, but, but so these may be maybe irrelevant to you, but I, to, some, to say something that is relevant is having not, not, you know, by any kind of very wise decision, tried following this this route, it turned out to be to have worked out quite okay. I, mean, I, I, I don't know, I, I seem to have done all right. Uh, the, the thing that people 
tend not to do is to, to, to be this kind of contrarian and try to go after people much more powerful and influential than ourselves, right? We tend to think that it's not so wise. Uh, I was foolish enough to do that, but the, what I learned is that actually it's a pretty good strategy because, because a lot of those people are much more powerful and famous and influential than we are. They are not going to get more powerful and influential. Right? So in, in terms of investment, you're, you're buying at a good price. Like You make some enemies, but they're not going to become more frightening in the future. Uh, instead, you actually earn, a, you make a lot of friends because those powerful, a lot of people actually are pretty upset by what they say and what they do or what they profess. And by challenging them, you, you, you burn some bridges, but you make a lot of new friends. And those new friends, some of them would turn out very well, right? Because some of them are young and but didn't have the, it wasn't so foolhardy to go after those famous people, but they, they feel, oh, this is great. So they become your friend. And there's some, a lot of other middle career people who also don't want to do this, but if you start to challenge the status quo, you actually earn a lot of friends. And some of those friends become really important later on, like uh, like some of my collaborators. I think that's great you know, advice for So don't, don't be afraid, just piss, piss them off. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I have a question kind of, uh, this is a question both for Hakwan and Tony. Right, because in the book, right, Hakwan actually thinks that, you know, getting uh, empirical results it should be the priority of our our field, right? Get more you know, data and before we you know kind of create more theory than all that. But then you know Tony is a philosopher. Right? I actually want to know like how you think about that. Because yeah, you want to say something about it? Uh, yes. So um, I'll, I'll make this really brief. Uh, last year, I had a paper with two collaborators. One is Phil in the back, and the title is, I think it's something like, Taking Conceptual Issues Seriously. So it might sound like I'm opposing that stance, but actually it's not. So I agree with that, but why I, I still think we need to take conceptual issues seriously? Because sometimes in those big papers, they start out saying something like, this new framework can help us, say, address the hard problem. Then the form they formulate the hard problem. The formulation is entirely incorrect. So it's not like I'm a philosopher, so I care about those, those words. I mean, when scientists criticizing or talking about other scientists, they need to take their words for it. We need to be charitable. We need to take into context. But at the same time, they literally doesn't say, don't say something. So don't settle them as don't settle them the view that they are not holding. So I would say I agree with that stance. But on the other hand, also we need to be really careful. So I think in Hakon's book, you also mentioned, um, so I mentioned in the summary, um, there are some conceptual confusions in some case studies, right? So that would be my brief answer. Yeah, I certainly remind people that Paul uh, by Sidney Brenner, the, the Nobel Prize winner, who said something like, you know, in science, progress is driven by um, data, I'm sorry, methods, data, and idea in that order of importance. So, so he was basically saying that methods is actually the most important, the second important is, uh, is result, and the third important is idea. So for someone coming from philosophy, a uh, philosopher, philosopher wannabe, I always like, that, that, that statement always irritated me. But it was actually true. If you really think about the, the how the field changes, right? So optogenetics uh, exploded in the past, you know, like over a decade ago, really changed the entire field. That's why, I like, uh, watching uh, 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 Professor Chan's uh, keynote yesterday was so amazing. Even though he was so humble to say he doesn't talk about consciousness, those studies would change everything. We we should all be aware of that, right? So so methods do change and. Unfortunately, I'm not a methods geek. I'm, I'm very far from that. So I always thought, how do I turn my ideas into methods? Right? That's basically kind of what I do for a living. So taking ideas sometimes from philosophy or from just thinking and, and conceptual ideas, but don't just conceptualize them and, and write about them. I, I find that, I mean, I do too, but the, 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 the way that actually helped my career uh, made any any progress is you turn those ideas into methodological uh, tools. So by identifying what everyone else is not controlling for these confounds or 
how how systematic uh, flaws in, in studies or how what what kind of alternative interpretation they haven't thought about to use it to motivate a whole line of empirical research. And that is the right um, So I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of stay away from the book for a while, asking some questions about you know, the, the general status of the field. Uh, so a quick survey, how many of you know about the uh, this area of collaboration? Okay, not, not many. All right, so it's, um, it's basically a collaboration between the localists and the globalists that are trying to yeah, they design so they, they sit together try to design series of experiments to examine you know uh, the, the, the theories, right? Um, so the question I wanted to ask Hakon was um, Hakon was involved in the kind of the very early collaborations, right? And then you know so basically you had kind of first hand experience of the collaborations and all that, yeah. And then you know at some point you decided not to join them, yeah. So I want to know more about you know your Experience of the collaboration. Uh, I think because of the time, I would like to open up to you know questions to the floor. Anybody? Yeah, uh, this is uh, this is a really great uh, uh, discussion. So thank thank you all for setting it up and hop on for for being willing to to do this. So I'm about a, a third of the way through uh, your book, uh, but you and I spoke a little bit yesterday. And the question I I have for you is uh, about you know how do we keep the field you know sort of going. Uh, uh, on sort of a straight mainstream scientific status while not accidentally, you know, excluding, you know, other perspectives, you know, other fields that may have input. And I'll just give you just very briefly, like my own perspective, you know, as a, you know, cognitive behavioral neurologist, cognitive neuroscientist, you know, I mean, like I sort of firmly believe we're going to be able to solve the mysteries of, of consciousness, you know, just using the standard experimental psychology, cognitive neuroscience uh, methods. Um, but I know there's a lot of other, you know, perspectives out there. And, you know, I will just say my own experience in terms of neurology and doing memory disorders, like when I was in fellowship, if you had told me that we're going to be able to reduce Alzheimer's disease by like a third by being, you know, more social and eating a Mediterranean, you know, menu of foods and exercising more, you know, I would have laughed. And so would have every other sort of mainstream academic, you know, dementia researcher. But now it turns out those are hugely important factors. So how, how do we move the field forward, keep it on a scientific basis without accidentally excluding other perspectives that could turn out to be relevant? I think the short answer is uh, don't worry about it. Because the, those perspectives, I think it's a matter of balance, right? Right now, the, the, the wilder, more blue sky and more empirically unhinged approaches, they are, they are running the show. So even if we hit them as hard as we can, they would not make a dent. It would find it would still be there. So let's just hit them as hard as we can. That's my recommendation. And the the other thing is also like let's say we somehow with some really unexpected luck eliminated the current wave of the wilder, more unhinged approach. I I, I think the field itself, just as in in, in neurology, uh, those Alzheimer's ideas didn't, didn't die out, right? So somehow they make, they have a way of making make their way back. So we don't want to make the field so uh, um, unfriendly and hostile to, to, to each other. So that's not the intention, but it's just to let's restore the balance a little bit. And from there, of course, you know, any field 
when you when you go for fringe ideas, of course, you go against the grain. It would be harder, and that's fine. But but we are not going to completely eliminate them or, or, or abolish them. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Aquan, and thanks uh, on your chat for the, the discussion. Uh, just one comment and then a, a question. I think that's uh, um, what you're describing is something that some philosophers of science are, are noticing as well, is that climate science was not respectable and respected until there was a consensus. And then politicians started to listen and journalists started to listen and so on. And this has really made everybody believe that consensus is the right way of doing science. And it's not a question is like when are things right for consensus? And I think that's that's an important thing to just like remind people also that not all sciences are at the same stages, and there is an eagerness for consensus as a sign of scientificity. And maybe in, in some cases, actually, pluralism is the right thing because we are not, and cons forcing consensus would be very wrong. Uh, so, yeah, that was the comment, but maybe not. No, I, I think I entirely agree. And, and I think the, the what is important is also like we, we need to get consensus not just within the field, right? So, there are also neighbor, uh, our like vision scientists right now, a lot of them don't think much about what we do anyway. So, even if we agree within our field, that we are, we have a consensus. It's not going to help very much. And also, there are you know people like me who, who's never going to agree to the status quo anyway. So we're not going to achieve that kind of consensus in any time. Just to uh, I think that obviously the reality. And then the the question was more. You mentioned it, so what do you think about the report card? <laughs> <laughs> Short answer. I talk about it in the book. So no report paradigm as a plus phrase happened about 10 years ago. Well before that, there are studies that control for the report. Um, and the consensus, I think, if you look at the literature, is that, well, basically, so, so to those of you who don't know what no, no report paradigms are, so when you do a, a perceptual study, usually you ask people to report what's the content. That's how you relay the, the percept to the neural activity. And then some people challenge that it is the reporting itself that is that that is reflected in those neural correlates. It's not the the content, right? So so you have a confound, and in experiments, as I said, you have confounds, and you deal with it. You you try to vary a condition to remove that confound and see whether it changes anything. It's it's never meant to be a paradigm, right? Just controlling for confound. When, when does it become a paradigm? A trend setting new thing and inspired you know dozens of studies. Turns out that people have been doing this since the 90s, and if you read the literature, the, the conclusion is it changes a little bit. If you use a crude methods like like late ERPs, yeah, then the report seems to, seems to matter. But if you use any kind of more more detailed and, and uh, uh, better uh, higher higher power uh, measurement, it doesn't change much. So we effectively over the past decade, we have created these dozens of studies that keep saying the same thing. If you control for it, if you control for doing this novel, groundbreaking, trend-setting new thing, it would repeat what we already know. So that would to me. A, Maybe you shouldn't say it's a problem, but it, it reflects the underlying structure of the field. We just like like these buzzwords and don't sit down and talk about the, the, the literature enough. A lot of people have to realize that a lot of you know high profile papers do not actually do not review the literature very carefully. There's a question from front end. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I'm going to start by being very, very honest and say that I'm really happy to came here to actually hear you talk about your book because when I saw the book, again, a book on consciousness, I said, you know, remind me of the In God We Trust on the dollar bill. And I said, it's like, oh, maybe I don't want to trust in consciousness, so I'm going to just skip this one. So I'm actually very happy because I said, okay, there's nothing to do with that. So I'm going to read your book, yeah. Um, but my question is more... Um, so, you know, because you, you, and also I'm, I'm very happy to hear that you have a background in philosophy and it kind of like now makes sense, all the critical stance that you're taking, and I think that's super important. So, you know that when you ask a question, the way you frame the question is basically gives you half the answer because you're after certain things, right? So, 
once upon a time, there was this idea that the circle was a perfect figure, right? And because everything was created by God, everything has to move in circles, right? And people were trying to figure out, you know, to explain what is happening in the, you know, the sky through the circus. And then they couldn't fit the maths, couldn't fit the observation, right? Maths with observation. And they were trying to have really little circles, single little circles, AP circles, right? <laughs> to make sense of the data because the data was like very different from the theories that they had, right? Up until a point I kept up came and said, well, actually, maybe it's not a circle. Maybe it's just like an AP circle, right? So something which is not round, so we need to get rid of that. Yeah. So here's my question to you, though, uh, because I, from what I'm saying, I feel like this idea that somehow if we look close enough into neurons uh, in the brain, we will figure out what consciousness is or conscious experiences. To me, from the outside, looks very much a bit like that thing. So it's like, okay, so maybe actually we should zoom out a bit um, and look at how, first of all, how neurons emerge. <laughs> So how they develop, right? So, uh, and I'm pushing this because I'm, I'm trying also to uh, look to the field from a different paradigm where instead of asking what consciousness is, but I think it's way more interesting to ask how consciousness emerge, develops, yeah? So how, because this is not something like fixed, it's something that evolves and declines, yeah. Uh, so yeah, so that's my question to you. Yeah, I, I... So we agree, actually, I, I do not mean to say that the uh, studying the neurocorrelate, oh, sorry, I don't, I, I don't mean to say that studying the neurocorrelate of consciousness would be sufficient for understanding. I just mean that we, sh we should not, we should not pretend that we are done, like, right? we are very far from done. Uh, and, and once you have the neurocorrelate, and what you do is, I think, just like what the rest of neurobiology does, is that you start to propose models, and, and presumably uh, with the current AI explosion, the, we will have models that would actually learn and evolve, right? So you don't you don't just build the model, but you build an algorithm that would learn the learn how to build the model itself, um, and then then you can use the NCC data as your empirical yardstick to, to to try to fit to the model. And I think that seems to be a reasonable approach. Uh, and 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 that does mean that you know the theories are not totally irrelevant, but the but the theories should be serving the purpose of fitting the data. And we should get the data right, and otherwise we have nothing to fit. And I think the problem right now is that I think a lot of people don't think that way. They just want to write down the equation from an armchair and then whatever, then contour some really poorly designed studies and try to confirm themselves. So that's the problem. Um, can I follow up just very briefly? So in some of the new frameworks, they don't say we're well done with NCC and we can move on. They actually say the NCC program is wrong-headed, so it should be replaced. And that's what I disagree, and maybe Hagwan disagrees too. So there are some really strong views saying that that entire project is wrong, and we don't really have time to summarize that. It's just a reminder that maybe we can all look into those new frameworks. Maybe uh, we, we can figure out whether we really need those new ones as opposed to the original project. to ask this question. So after the no report paradigm, I think we said all time to talk about IT, I guess. So we already did. <laughs> yeah, so um, as a graduate student, right? So basically, I think there's there are two different things that we can kind of uh, differentiate here. One is their approach, one is their belief, right? So as a graduate student, when I first kind of look into the theory, you know, how they uh, wanted to do a calculating consciousness, it sounds fine. Right, and it, it sounds fine to the, the general public as well, right? Because we, we have a theory that we want to calculate uh, the amount of uh, conscious awareness you have in the system, right? What if, I mean, you probably have said this many, many times, but what do what you think about it? I, I think the idea that concerning, you know, being awake and not being awake or even uh, being in REM sleep versus not being in REM sleep, which, which sort of tracks dreaming but not perfectly as people will acknowledge. Predicting those states by using some sort of uh, network complexity measures, it, it clearly worked, I think empirically. So those, the whole thing is not like totally trash. But to take from that to then go on into panpsychism, that is to acknowledging that, you know, just some, you hook up some 
an active logic gate in some sort of complex way, even if it's not doing any sort of useful cognition or computation, it would still be conscious. They actually would say it in print. I think that's clearly too far. And then to force a particular measure of complexity, given that you know their graph theory and complexity measures and network sign, and to force a particular measure that they favor and say that this is the only way of or the highway. Meanwhile, having those measures being basically uncomputable and practically and theoretically, uh, I think that's just not very good. And that's okay to be not very good. I, I said like a lot of the whole field is not very good. But the really damning problem is we've been sort of forced to do the opposite of putting our best foot forward as a field for something that is not very good. I think most people in the field know that it's not very good, but yet it's been promoted to the public as if it is already the state of the art. And I think that will trigger a lot of backlash. Other questions from the audience? Uh, okay, uh, thank you for this talk. Okay, yes, thank you for the talk. Um, so my question is a bit more practical because you mentioned that uh, in this field there are a lot of like methodological or even like assumptions that's maybe flawed or limited. So like two questions, like for you personally, uh, what kind of maybe like uh, guidance or how do you usually navigate through these kind of fields? So what kind of maybe ways are did you um, maybe like when you are doing literature, literature studies, so what did you usually maybe see first and for you personally? And then for us, maybe like for the junior uh, graduate students, uh, we may not have that kind of experience or knowledge. And so what will you suggest um, we see first or maybe like the types of things that we need to consider? when we study in this field. Thank you. Yeah, so I think the, I, I, I keep going back to this one point because in the book I also said, if you get this one thing right, you would, it would change your entire take on the, the empirical literature. It's that performance capacity compound thing I talk about. So if you make sure that you are, when you're studying conscious perception, you're not just studying a lot of perception or very powerful perception. That is, if you compare perception in your non-conscious perception condition, you make sure that there is a lot of signal there as well. If you can do this one thing, it would change everything, I think. So that that's a specific. And and generally, I think just you know, spending more time sitting down and when you read paper, just don't take their words for it. Always try to take it apart, think about what what may be the problems in papers, because every paper has problems, right? And I think we should, I mean, including mine, I acknowledge them in my books too. And and you should always just have a critical, have a habit to be critical of, of everything you read. And I think that's important. That's actually quite a great talk. And so I think the series of consciousness is all based on the human adults or some model animals. So what do you think the evolution and the development of consciousness? So I think that uh, from birth to death, uh, we are changing. So I think that uh, like the developmental change of consciousness is also the, uh, like the nature of consciousness. So what do you think? Yeah, I, I think I entirely agree. Uh, the problem, the, the problem uh, maybe that getting the quality data from, from infants and, and young children are harder. Uh, but at the same time, getting quality data from animals regarding subjective experience is not easy either. Some people have done work that I admire, like Sigurdera, so they have done infants and preverbal infants. And I think it can be done. It just, you know, developmental psychology is hard, I think, in general, uh, not just for consciousness. I think the data is hard to collect and the, the, the behavioral paradigms, the essays you can use are, are, are limited. But um, having said that, I mean, the, the field has done okay, right? I mean, you, you just have to theorize very carefully, make your predictions very, very 
very clearly so that you can test them given the I think it's very important, especially also related to what Anna asked about earlier. It, studying the, the emergence of this phenomenon is important, and, and currently the AI models are very useful for that. Right? So you can actually build the training algorithm to, to see how you can train the, the network to do what it ultimately will do. So, so I, I have high hopes about that area. I'm studying the children and consciousness, so I'm very happy to hear your comments. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I have somewhat more of a philosophical question to ask. Uh, uh, one of the more contentious parts of the theory, as I saw, was that it suggests robots or uh, AI could be conscious. Um, well, like just from a philosophical intuition kind of point of view, that seems somewhat more extreme, more counterintuitive. Um, and that kind of leads me to like maybe a methodological question. Do you think there could be any way to like uh, maybe measure the subjective experience of that robot directly? I mean, um, in the sense that when we use human subjects, we ask them to report their experiences. And how, like, if we ask a robot to report the experiences, should we trust it the same way we trust human reports? Um, is there, yeah, can you comment a bit on that, that kind of problem? Yeah, kind of problems? I would say the answer Strictly is no, right? Because it's easy to program a robot to say that it's conscious. Uh, it would take five lines of MATLAB or something. It's of course, not of very <laughs> and you don't want to take that, right? So, so I think what you need to do is to think about the functional architecture underneath. So the the controversial part of the theory comes down to functionalism. Yeah. Right? I'm a functionalist. I think that the understanding of the brain and the mind is to understand it as kind of like a kind of implementation of some algorithm. And so the physical substrate doesn't matter, essentially. So I'm, I'm a functionalist. And you don't have to be a functionalist. But if you're not a functionalist, which is interesting, so some people would say that they're biocyclists, like Peter uh, Dr. Smith and, and Victor Lama, they would say that, well, the biological substrate matters. I, I'm not an expert in this area, but I, as a you know, practicing neuroscientist, it, it doesn't make sense to me. Because I feel that if, I, if you go to any other branch of biology, Nobody would say that the substrate in itself matter beyond what it functionally does, right? Any 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 branch of biology to understand a substrate is, is to understand its mechanism and by which they, they basically need to function. So genetics, I mean why why DNA, why double helix, right? It's nothing like the shape itself is beautiful. It's because it actually allows you to copy some sort of information in, within the kind of biochemical context, right? So it's always about the mechanism, what it functionally contributes. So to the extent that you understand the human case and how, how our mechanisms functionally contribute, then I just don't see how, why you cannot just duplicate the exact function in, in computers. Uh, I, this, is part, this part definitely is speculative, but I, I sort of try to lay out the, the reasoning behind it. Thank you. We'll take one last question before we wrap up. Uh, there's right. one there. So I think this is a follow-up question to your previous answer. So in a philosophy, there's a very long, long-standing tradition that you know, consciousness and intentionality or theory of representation content is two separate things. And uh, myself as a philosopher uh, has invested a lot of time in uh, nationalizing intentionality without paying any attention to consciousness. And this uh, brings me uh, a very intriguing question that relates to your previous answer that, well, uh, if those two things are two separate things, I mean, on the, on the far left end of the spectrum, there are, say, uh, and psychists who thinks that two things are intimately related. On the other side of the end, there's a like, extreme functionalist, like Jerry Porter, who doesn't think that consciousness plays any, you know, any kind of role. Well, in some sense, and consciousness can be simply taken as epiphenomenal. I mean, well, not Jared Fodder endorsed this position, but I mean, you know, yeah. So I was, I'm very curious about what your position is supposed to be. I mean, are you taking some kind of a middle ground? And if, if that's the case, then uh, what makes you think that phenomenal consciousness plays any kind of, 
fundamental role in the in the way that we you know we our community lives. So I, I am a functionalist, uh, but I'm not a first order representationalist. So I don't think you can just uh, cash out or, or explain the, the nature of phenomenal consciousness purely in terms of just the simple uh, representational content of sensory uh, vehicle. However, I do think that within the language of functionalism, that is a computational function, uh, representational, that kind of basically like talking about it as if it's software architecture, you can actually have a functional description of phenomenal consciousness. And it's not too complex a thing. It basically means that you have sensory signals that are subjectively qualitative, right? So you have, you have sensory signals that represent itself as asserting to the about certain states of the world. And it also is expressed in a, in a format that kind of makes it compulsory for you to appreciate the signal in relation to other signals. So like I talked about yesterday, so pink is the color that is more similar to purple and, and, uh, and red than, than to blue and, and silver. Right? So if you think about the similarity relation, the whole structure, if it's in that format, and if it kind of asserts itself as, as you know, representing the world right now, all of these are functional descriptions. And I think that's maybe all there is to, to phenomenal consciousness. And in that sense, you can be a functionalist without being a first order of representation. All right, so it was really a great honor and our pleasure to have Hakon here for this inaugural symposium. Um, yeah, thank you Hakon for sharing I should thank you. Yeah, I think your book and uh, I hope you're all in life as much as I am. And uh, you know, in two years, you're probably going to have another corn please. If you write another book, you might have another <laughs> symposium for you. I took uh, my book for summary of two decades of research. So it took give me two decades. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> You can have a new review, you know. People publish review papers all the time. Other people probably will write better books than mine. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see about that. Yeah. So that's thank you again.